<laughs> Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You can tell my church is here, right? Amen. Praise God. Appreciate you coming out. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts 19. I'm going to start reading verse 11. I want to thank Pastor Elliot for the opportunity of preaching. I, um, when I found out, I, I called him up. He usually has me towards the end of the week. And so I asked him, uh, thanks, Pastor, you had me at the start. I go, why would you put me at the start for? He goes, well, Dan, I was hoping like, like a vote of confidence, you know, get my faith up and running. He goes, Dan, so we can, if you are at first, then we can sort out all the false doctrine by the end of the week, and we'll have it all planted. And so with that vote of confidence, I'm ready this morning. And uh, usually in rugby, they have the first run, and it's a privilege to take that first run, so I get the first run. Amen. X 19. You see these old uh, cowboy movies, and I'm sure nobody here watches cowboy movies. But when you watch your cowboy movies, you see many times these posters, and they have these most wanted posters. You know what I'm talking about? It's the sheriff wants these guys, usually dead or alive, and they pay a sum. And the reason why they have these guys on these posters is because these guys have done great damage uh, to that town, that region. Uh, there's been, they've caused problems. Most, most of the time, it's not because they stole a chocolate bar uh, from 7-Eleven, which all the Only Hunger Church will be in jail for, but... It's, it's about doing real damage. It's about actually uh, causing problems to that town. And they have these most wanted posters. The FBI have a, a top 10 most wanted criminals. And these are the people that have done major damage to not just our nation, but around the world. September 11, everybody, once I say that, uh, that day, everybody remembers what happened when, when the, these crazy, demonic, possessed Muslim guys came and, and hijacked these planes and, and killed over 3,000 innocent people. And that day was a horrible day. And the reason why is because they caused such great damage to our society, to America, but through the whole, not just America, but through the whole world. I remember reading the newspaper that time. I was only 11, but I could still remember it. That on the front page, there was a massive photo of Osama bin Laden there with his ugly beard. And he's there and, he, and they see him and this is the man. And we remember this guy we remember what he looks like. We know what he's done. We remember that date because of the damage that he caused. America retaliated, bombed the heck out of him and sorted him out in Afghanistan. But the FBI said, we will stop at, uh, he will stop at nothing. He is willing to pay the ultimate cost for his beliefs. He was finally captured uh, almost 10 years later. And I remember still, even when I was still here in Melbourne, I remember I was at work and it came on the radio that he had been captured and killed and everybody stopped and we started celebrating. And so we're at work, this guy's on the other side of the world, but we were so happy because this guy caused damage. This guy, even though he was behind the scenes and he attacked our lives, we knew who he was. We knew his name. We knew what he looked like. And when he was captured, there was great joy. He attacked our lives. He attacked our communities. He attacked our peace. Everybody knew who he was and everyone knew his name. And the reason I tell that story is we've got a question for you this morning, church, as we start off. Does the devil know who you are by the damage that you're causing to his kingdom? Because we don't need 7-Eleven Christians stealing chocolate bars. We need some guys that are really going to make damage to the gates of hell and really push the kingdom forward. We're soldiers. We're not supposed to sit here in church and just go through the motions. We're supposed to attack the very gates of hell. Take the land, not just sit in your church. There should be something about us that, that pushes forward. Every time that the devil and his boys, his demons have a meeting, does your name come up and does your photo come up? They say, this guy's causing damage. This guy's making impact and we need to stop him. Or are you the 7-Eleven chocolate bar stealing Christian? Let's do this, eh? So let's read Acts 19. Every person here, you have incredible potential to do great things in God, to storm the gates of hell, and I pray that you do in your family, your workplace, your school, in your community, but we must have the Holy Ghost. So let's read Acts 19 as I try and open these complicated waters. Acts 19, 11. The Bible says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs, or aprons were brought, uh, were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out from them. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. Also uh, there were seven sons of Siva, the, se the Jewish chief priests, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, 
and Paul I know, but who the heck are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit had leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Let's pray before we start. God, we come into your presence this morning, God, instill in our hearts, God, this desire to make our name known, God, against the devil. Let's really take dominion, God, this week in our cities, God. We, we pray for the Holy Ghost movement, God. We give you all the glory for what you're going to do in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. Let's look firstly at the need to be a threat or a world changer. And like, uh, similar to what Pastor Mitchell preached last night, all of us have something in us. God has put something in us to make an impact. To, we all have ambitions in life because we want to make a change. We want to make a difference. We want our lives to have meaning. Kids, when, they, when they're young, they say, what do you want to do when you're older? And they always talk about something that's great. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a fireman. I want to be part of the greatest rugby team in the world, the Wallabies. And so they, they always want to do something great. They want to be part of something uh, that makes their life count. And that's how God has created us. But the problem is the devil has, has tweaked that and kinked that. And now people give themselves to absolutely worthless things. D.L. Moody said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. I was reading an article in New Zealand. A New Zealand man has been searching to find a moose. A moose. And we don't even know if this moose exists. He's been searching in the South Island. There have only been four sightings of this moose ever. The last sighting was in 1953. For a moose, the life expectancy is 25 years. The moose is dead. Someone ate it, it's over. (laughs) He's been searching since 1994. 23 years of his life, he has dedicated to searching for a stinking moose that's dead. And he's given himself to it. He's totally dedicated. He's, He's got this weird relationship with this moose. And he's totally dedicated to make his life count. And... But it's a worthless cause. Save the whales, save the trees, God bless you. But those things don't last in eternity. What we need in our generation is not some crazy people looking for a moose one day. What we need is soldiers of Jesus Christ attacking the gates of hell. We need to be pushing forward soldiers to storm his gate. Jesus called for our lives to count for his purposes, not our own. He never ever said, do what you please and then try and fit me in when you can. We have been called. The goal of every believer is you must be a threat to, to, uh, to the gates of hell. We are to populate heaven by depopulating uh, hell. We are not here to, say, to sit in a seat like Pastor Mitchell preached last night. God bless you for coming to church, but we are called for more than that. We're not got to go through life and hopefully make heaven our home one day when we see him, but we, this uh, life that we've been given by God, not to live average Christianity, not to live mediocre Christianity, but to live the Holy Ghost Christianity and taking dominion. We are called to be a threat. Take back dominion what the devil has taken from us. And listen to me, church. If your name is written in heaven, it should be known in hell. If your name is written in heaven, it should be known in hell. Because the devil only has nightmares about those who are taking the land. He only has nightmares about those who are are, uh, stealing souls from his kingdom. Not those churches that sell sausages on the street to save their money and to build and have youth group and dances and all this rubbish that goes on in New Zealand. But to rescue souls from hell. We are called to be fruitful in, in John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Unfruitfulness, we've heard many times, is unacceptable. And if you allow unfruitfulness in your, in your life, you're allowing defeat. And you've already lost before the battle's even, even started. So number one, we're called to be fruitful, but we're called to make a difference. We know the parable of the talents in, in Matthew 25. Gave one five, gave one two, gave one one. And he wants the, 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 the master comes back to see, did you make a profit here? Did you move forward here? Or, or what, what were you doing here? It wasn't to preserve. See, the, one, the guy that had one, he still had it. He just hid it. But... The, the father said, you need to, you need to get some, make something out of this. How come you didn't even deposit? Why didn't you move forward? Why didn't you make impact with what I've given you? And that's our calling today to make a difference. Isn't that the foundation of the fellowship? That's what I love about Potter's House. We're such an aggressive fellowship. I love it. It is so good. In this woman preaching, man bun wearing society that we live in, we finally have a man that leads by example, evangelism, discipleship, 
take the world. We're street preaching. My boys the other day, they went into the TAB. They jumped on the table and they said, listen, we're not here to cause problems, but y'all need Jesus. And so they street preaching, they get him kicked out and they've been kicked out of heaps of shopping centers. But praise God, they were actually getting kicked out for doing something instead of sitting at home doing nothing. And so there should be an acceleration that I want to make a difference. I want to count. And that's the fellowship that we live in. It should, we should, all of us should be, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Not just the preacher. It should be all of us. That should be on our hearts. Our mission is to turn the world upside down for Jesus. Acts 17, 6. And they dragged Jason, not Pastor Hughes, but, and some brethren of the rulers of the city crying out, Those, these uh, who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Wouldn't that be great when we go to a city and they're like, oh no, these guys are here again. These are the guys that turn the world upside down in Melbourne and in Onihanga and over in India and in Geelong. These are the same guys that are coming to our city as well. And I can imagine the devil, he's freaking out about this. He's, he's having nightmares and he's, he's, his thing is, but he, the nightmare, it continues. It's not a nightmare, it's reality. We're taking dominion for Jesus. Just last week, we went to Otara for an impact team. On this Friday night, we had 15 saved, I believe, during the day. On Saturday outreach, we had over 30 saved. At the concert that night, we saw over 60 people saved, over 100 people saved in 24 hours because I want the devil to have nightmares. I'm not going to have sausages and have fun and let's just have fellowship. No, let's take the world for Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. So we're part of a fellowship that's known in hell. That's a threat. But the question is, are you a threat? Because we could say, I'm Potter's house, I'm Potter's house. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not too sure. Because it says in our text, verse 15, the evil spirit answered, said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but you doesn't really ring a bell. If it was to apply today, Potter's house I know, Pastor Mitchell I know, Pastor Elliot I know, but, but who are you? Sorry? You know, the Golden State Warriors, the greatest basketball team in the world. My church, no, they make it in every sermon. They're in every sermon. They're always there. But there was one team, we were playing OKC, and there was one, team, one guy on, on, the, on the team that his name was Andre Robertson, uh, Robertson. And so he's playing, but this guy couldn't shoot for peanuts. He couldn't hit the side of a barn. This guy's hopeless. And so, but he's there, he's wearing his jersey. He's got OKC, okay, so he's got Robertson on his back. And so, but the, pro- the problem is he can't, he's not effective. And so Golden State was losing the game, and then they finally clicked. This guy's not even a threat. And so what they did is they just double teamed everybody else, and so they had to pass the ball to Robinson, and he's missing everything, and Golden State came back and won. And so he's wearing the jersey. He's on the team. He's part, I'm OKC, he's part of it. But he's not making any impact. And we can come to conference and wear the jersey with our tie and with our jacket. I'm Potter's house, I'm Potter's house. But are you making impact? Because if you're not, you're hurting the rest of the team. The team needs to win. Are you personally making impact? In our text, they use the same words. In Jesus' name, evangelism, discipleship, church. They said the same words, but there was no impact. There was no power, and they got beat up naked. Great story. <laughs> so is your name known in hell? You know, our guys, they go street preaching. You've heard this, and they do their chants. We're on fire for God. We're on fire. And they're into it. You hear our guys, some fire. This means they, they want to fight. We, we, we're bashing the devil. We're moving forward. Bust the cap. Bust this. Bust your head. And they're doing all this. But I'm like, bro, you can't even bust your pillow in the morning. <laughs> we're worried about busting the devil. How about you just get out of bed? How about you just win someone for Jesus and then worry about busting the devil? We're on fire. Jack, you're on fire. You're not on fire. You wouldn't know what fire was. If it was Ash Wednesday, you wouldn't know what fire was. You totally missed the point here. It's about souls. It's about fruitfulness. It's about kingdom dominion. And that needs to be our calling. That needs to be in all of us, to be a thorn in the devil's side. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about, yeah, I'm attacked by the devil. Those guys, I love just being attacked. I don't like being attacked by the devil. It's like, yeah, we're getting attacked. That means... Not really. Sometimes you just might be doing something bad. That's why it's not working. But I'm not pushing that. What I am pushing is that we need to make a difference. And the only way to make a difference is through the Holy Ghost. This is what's missing in too many Christians and too many churches. You know, there's a saying, the lights are on but no one's home. Ever heard that saying before? What does that mean? It means they're a bit, you right? Something is missing. They're home but they're not really home, right? 
It's like when you go to a house, the lights are on, but people should be living inside the house. And if no one's living there for a long time, it gets old, it gets moldy, creatures can live in there, and all sorts of things happen that shouldn't happen in a normal house. Listen, the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And if the Holy Ghost isn't working inside of you, the lights might be on, you might be at church, but the Holy Ghost isn't moving, something's missing on the inside. Churches today, the lights are on, they're opening their doors, but something is missing on the inside. It looks normal, but the Holy Ghost is missing. 2 Timothy 3, 5, holding a form of godliness, although denying its power. Like Pastor Mitchell said, the devil's not scared about that you come to church. And praise God for coming to church. But the devil's not worried about that. You know, today we have better church buildings than ever before in history. We have more resources than ever before. I have literally hundreds of books, PDFs on my hard drive. I don't, know, I don't have a lack of, of knowledge of, uh, of there, of resources. We have more money than we ever had before. But are we really making as much impact as we ever have before? Because sometimes we can rely on the building and our showmanship and our talent instead of relying on the Holy Ghost. The devil's not afraid of anyone who isn't consumed with the Holy Spirit. William Booth said, I consider that the chief dangers of what confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. And unfortunately, that's what's happening. So let's look secondly at three characteristics of those who threaten hell. If you want to make your life count, you want to be part of hell's most wanted list, there's three characteristics that apply to us. And the first characteristic is that those who threaten hell are totally dedicated in discipleship. I read an article. Two Australian brothers who recently joined ISIS were not allowed to fight as they were too fat. <laughs> two of them, they are quite obese. They are not good soldiers, Jamil Rafi, the leading Islamic community leader, told a Sydney radio station. I mean, they're over 140 kilos. What are we going to do with them? They're going to eat all our food and they can't even run on the field. So I was talking to Pastor Anderson about this. <laughs> Look, listen, even ISIS have standards. And we complain about TV. That ISIS, you can't even get in, bro. Too fat. Listen, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you might need to cut the flesh from time to time. And there's this really cute quote. Oh, it's not about my ability. It's about my availability. <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. Because these ISIS dudes, they were available, but they're too fat. Missed out. The rich young ruler was available, but he didn't have the ability to cut off the flesh, to cut off carnality. And many Christians, God, use me, but I still want to keep my bank balance above this, this level. God, use me, I'm willing, but my family, I can't be away from my family. God, use me, but we're still not willing to cut off the flesh, lay it all down for Jesus. Today, we've replaced picking up your cross with this casual, carnal, and cozy Christianity. And that is not Je what Jesus preached ever. Matthew 16, 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I'm talking about radical discipleship, radical Christianity. What this world needs is not more churches. What this world needs is more disciples. This is, what, this is the calling of this generation. Someone said, in a world where everything revolves around self, protect yourself. Promote yourself, preserve yourself, entertain yourself, comfort yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus said, slay yourself. You can't read the Bible and not realize that Jesus says you need to die every day. And before you, Jesus says, before you want to follow me, remember, pick up your cross. Remember that there's a sacrifice here. And you might say, Paul, that's a bit full on. Well, yeah, if you don't, this is far too costly who, to those people who aren't sold out for Jesus. If you're on the fringes, this is way too costly for you. And Jesus had to deal with this, even his own disciples, in John 6, 6, 6. It gets a bit tough, and the Bible says, from that day forward, many disciples turned away. And I love what Jesus said. You know, in our churches, some people leave. We're heartbroken. We're trying to cause, chase them. And Jesus says to his other disciples, you guys want to go too? Because Jesus said, I need full discipleship here. And Peter, what a great answer. He says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where are we going to go? He says, I'm sold out for this. So disciple, are you, are you ready? Can you, can you go all out for this? Costless Christianity is not supported in the scriptures. If it doesn't cost you anything, it will produce absolutely nothing. Pastors, we must preach this. 
You must preach discipleship. You must cultivate an atmosphere of discipleship in your church. What I've come to realize in, in trying to disciple the uh, young guys is that discipleship in a church is like a river. And if, if your discipleship is flowing and really pushing, the river, river flows. And when people jump in to your church and get saved, the culture is pushing them forward and they go very fast. They accelerate very quickly in Christianity and in their discipleship. But if you haven't stirred the waters and got that river flowing in discipleship, they're going to jump in, but they're not going to move. In our first two and a half to three years of our church, it was very, very hard to get the discipleship going. We had people coming, but they weren't really true disciples. Then some, some of the young guys, they really started taking on themselves. They started pushing. I challenged myself. I needed to push and get the river flowing. And I was pushing this river, and then it started to move. And then more people got saved. And then, then now this river is gushing. Listen, two weeks ago, a guy got saved uh, in our church, Sam. He's here this morning. He got saved two weeks ago. And now, two weeks later, he's in another country. In a conference. Why? Because the river's flowing in discipleship. And every pastor, don't be scared to preach commitment. Don't be scared to preach discipleship and sacrifice. Jesus preached it. We need to preach it too. And I understand early churches you preach, yeah, you're a bit softer, but you need to develop that culture. Make that river rush in your church. And so people jump in, they're on fire for Jesus straight away. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and build churches with heaps of people. Because anybody can get heaps of people. We aren't after swelling, we're after growth. You can smack your head against the wall and you will swell. We aren't after swelling, we're after growth. And so make sure your church is growing in discipleship, not swelling with people. And a church is not really a New Testament church if it doesn't have disciples. It doesn't reflect that. What this world needs is discipleship. So firstly, to be a world changer, be a threat. First, you need to be a, a disciple, totally committed. Number two, you need to learn how to rebound after failure. Rebounding in basketball is one of the most vital things because usually whoever gets the most rebounds usually wins the game. If you shoot over 50% of your shots in in the NBA, you're classified as a superstar. If you get over one in two in, you're a legend. So there's a lot of misses, but it's about rebounding. Good news tonight, church. All of us here have failed. Every single person, every single pastor you see up here, they have all struggled and all made mistakes. Winston Churchill said success is going from one failure uh, to, to another failure without losing enthusiasm. One of the greatest texts in the Bible is Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says, and I also say to you, uh, say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And this is such a great scripture, but we know Peter. Peter's up himself, cocky Peter, that's Peter. And so he's there, and he's like, boys, did you hear that? On me, Peter, the rock. Can you smell what the rock, can, can you smell? And he said, I'm, I'm the rock man. I'm the man, I'm the man. Yes, I am, yes. And he's here and he's, he's into it. He's like, I'm the, I'm the man here. I'm the rock. God's going to build on me. I love it. Five verses later, Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Disciples, your pastor ever called you Satan? <laughs> right? And Peter, he's always screwing up. Like, I love Peter because it gives me great faith when I stuff up that Peter, hey, he can recover too. Peter's off, he's swearing, he's saying, I don't bleep and know the bleeping, and he's off his head, and he's doing that, and then when they come to get Jesus, he's, he's slicing the guy's ear off, and Jesus is like, for crying out loud, Peter, how many times have I told you, like, leave the guy, he has to go heal the guy, he's always doing things, and he's over it, but listen, Peter was able to rebound from failure, and who preached the first altar call, it was Peter, and 3,000 people got saved. And so listen, don't focus on your failures and all your mistakes, focus on rebounding after that, lift your head up, and move forward in life. Stop worrying about how many bad things have happened in the past. Look, look at all the great men of the Bible. Most of them failed. And really bad too, might I add. Moses is killing guys. He's doing all, Abraham, sleeping with, it's, like, it's all over the place. But they rebound and they move forward. My first altar call when Pastor Elliot came to the church. Woo. My first outreach. We did it in Altona. Listen, here in Altona, you can preach about Joseph Smith, people still get saved. Like, it's such a fruitful area. You can do anything you want, people will get saved. So I was like, let's do, let's do Altona. Let's be fruitful before when Pastor Elliot comes. I got the band. I picked the band. I picked the testimonies. I picked the drama team. Got everything. Got there early. We all set up. And then Pastor Elliot comes. And I'm really excited. This is the first. I'm going to impress my pastor. This is my first, first outreach. Uh, show him. And he's like, what the heck's going on here? I was like, yeah, he's great. I'm thinking, yeah, he's, he's into it. And he's like, why have you got this music playing? I was like, I, I don't know. I, 
He goes, this is the wrong music for this demographic. I was like, oh, okay. Then we had the testimony. He goes, why you got these people for the testimony? You should have got this type of people. I was like, oh, okay. And then he goes, why have you got these fires? These fires are rubbish. Why don't you get these other? Why are you facing this way for? Why are the lights and, the, and this? Why are the altar call? The, the, even the sausages didn't even taste good. Like nothing. <laughs> it was horrible. Nothing won. Did the altar call, no one got saved. It was horrible. Then he redid the altar call. He made me sing for his Lord by myself a cappella in the park. <laughs> and all the boys right here were laughing at me. They're like, Pfft. They're staring at me. And so I look like a complete, utter idiot that day. I called my dad. I said, I don't know how to do an altar call. I don't know how to do an outreach. I'm quitting. I'm over it. Done. Finish. <laughs> but what am I going to do? Go home and cry for the rest of my life? Get over it. Go do another one. See people saved. And God is moving in our church. And, and, but I can't just say, that's it. We all fail. This happens. So what defines you is not failure. Fa failure is an event. It is not your life. And all of us have events of failures from time to time. Steph Curry, the greatest basketball player in the world, who plays with Golden State Warriors. There was one time he, he was shooting the, the three. He's a great, great shooter. And he, he missed 10 shots on the three ball in a row. He got zero out of 10. Now, even I could probably hit one out of 10. Like, come on. He missed 10 in a row. And they're all mocking him. Oh, he's, he's lost it. He's not good enough. He's not good enough. The very next game against the Lakers, he shot 13 threes, an NBA record. So he went from missing everything to getting the record. Listen, church, a disciple, you might be here and you just might be missing everything in life. You're just you're making mistakes here, here, here. Listen, just keep going and you can be doing great things for God very, very soon. Because it's not about your ability, it's about the Holy Ghost moving inside of you. And so don't worry about your failures. We all make mistakes. That's life. Don't be like that guy who stuffs up at sport on your sports team and he hangs his head. Then you can never get him to do anything because he's just moping around. No one likes it when you mope around, by the way, just chucking that out there. You're just there, you're oh, this, I'm just so hard. It's hard on everyone. So move forward from your failure. We, we can overcome. Never let success get to your head. Never let failure get to your heart. And listen to me, if you're not making mistakes, you're probably not trying hard enough. So we, we make mistakes, take risks. The third thing, firstly, discipleship. Secondly, rebounding from failure. The third thing that these men do is they continue playing when injured. The 2014... NRL Grand Finals between the Rabbitohs and the Bulldogs and Sam Burgess he had the first run of the game and he runs up and he gets smacked in the head in his first tackle he broke his eye socket and his cheekbone the first play so what's he going to do go home and cry he gets up he, you could see it, his cheek is like hanging off his head he gets up he continues playing gets the ball takes another run takes he ran he, get, he played the whole game the 80 minutes and they won the grand final with a fractured broken head he kept going. Church, the devil's going to do all he can. You might, you might have some, some pain in your life, but you just got to keep moving forward. It's easy to serve God when everything's great, amen? But when things are a bit tough, you just got to keep running. You just got to keep going towards victory. You know, when I played soccer, I was a defender, and um, this is pre-salvation, just throwing it out there. And so I wasn't a very nice defender because I wasn't very fast, and so if you, this, this attacker is going to get past me, he's going to know about it. I'm going to cork him in the leg, I'm going to step in my studs on his feet, I'm going to hurt this guy, because, hey, you don't get the ball past me, buddy. Don't make me look bad, I'm going to hurt you. And so if you just attack, and the best players, I'd, I'd hurt them the most. But, okay, before salvation, so don't do that. The reason I say that is that if you're going to move forward for Jesus Christ and attack, uh, go on the attack, the devil's going to try and wound you and try and hurt you along the way to stop you and to scare you from moving forward, but you can't live like this. The, factor, the deciding factor is, is how bad do you want to serve God? How bad do you want it? Because some people, they turn into soccer players, they get flicked like this, and they roll over in pain for the next six months. <laughs> Most of the time, the devil didn't even touch them. They, you see the replays in soccer, they didn't touch them, and they're screaming in agony. Oh, some people do that, and they're oh, I'm, I'm heartbroken, I'm this. I'm, get over it. The devil didn't even touch you. Get back up again. Keep moving forward. How bad do you want it? In our church, there's a man... See, this morning, he had a, uh, he's been saved three to four months, and he was performing his first concert on a, on a Saturday night. But the problem is, he plays rugby, and he hurt his knee, and he needed a full knee reconstruction. And so I was telling him, listen, and then he had to get the knee operation on the Friday, and the concert was on the Saturday. I said to him, Chris, don't worry about it. Just, we'll, we'll put you on the next concert. He said, no, nah, Pastor, I'm performing. This is my first, I'm performing. I was like, Chris, you're getting a full knee reconstruction. You can't get out of bed for like a month. It was chill. And he's like, no, no, I'll be there. I'm like, okay. So he does the knee operation on Friday. Saturday, we're at Outreach. Chris comes to Outreach, <laughs> telling people about Jesus. That night, he's at the concert in his crutches. 
He's wrapping, he's doing his hand with the crushes up in the, up in the sky. He's in pain. He couldn't walk for another two weeks after that. But it doesn't matter how much the pain is, he still wanted what God has for him. And that needs to be me and you. When life gets tough, too bad. Let's keep moving forward for Jesus Christ. Don't worry about that. Keep moving forward. So in times life is not easy. You have battles. You really do, do go through the valley of the shadow of death. But God's with us. And we keep moving forward. You can call in sick to work. Can't call in sick to the will of God for your life. Keep moving forward. Let's close with the power of the Holy Ghost. In our text, they didn't have the Holy Ghost and they got beat up really bad. But after this, something very interesting happened in Acts 19.20. The Bible says, In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. You know, church, with the Holy Spirit within us, man, everything is possible to us now. Jesus said, though, don't even attempt to do anything for God until you really have this Holy Ghost. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you have, uh, to are endured with power from on high. We must depend, church, listen, we must depend wholeheartedly on the Holy Ghost, not just methods. Not just, have, have you lied before? Have you, told a lie? have you stolen something before? What does that make you? You're a thief. Have you looked at a woman with lust before? Yeah, that's great. But what about the Holy Ghost? Because we're sometimes we're so stuck and I need to say this, I need to say this. And those things help. But do you have the Holy Ghost behind your words? Because you can say all the words you want, but you need the power of the Holy Ghost behind you. Charles Spurgeon said, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without, uh, without the wind and like coals without fire. We are useless. And so that should be a great encouragement to you and I. That I'm useless, but I've got the Holy Ghost, so I can do anything. And so my confidence doesn't come in who I am or my ability or, or what God's done in my life. It's about the Holy Spirit using my life for His purposes. You know, we need another Holy Ghost revival. We need another movement. I'm not here in New Zealand, over there in New Zealand, just to waste time and have a laugh and, and try and win some people to Jesus. I really want to have true revival. We talk about it, but I really want this thing to happen. We're pushing towards it. We're active in this. I want a movement to sweep the suburbs, the schools, the nation. Listen, our guys they got so fired up with the Holy Spirit one day at their school. They're off street preaching at their school. Uh, people got saved that day. Um, and so, but the teachers cracked it. They called the police. The police rocks up to their house. Oh, can you stop street? Police, go, go get some druggie off the street. Leave him alone. Like, what are you doing? Get him. Anyway. And so, I'm not offending Jake. But what I'm saying is that they're actually doing something. There should be something that we want another movement. We want to be radical in this. And so, if you're going to be ordinary, you only achieve ordinary things. There needs to be something different about your life. There should be an edge to your life that there's something supernatural is going to happen. Peter changed when he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Before that, he's a loser. He fails. He's nothing. After that, he's taken the world for Jesus. He's winning the world for Jesus. He's a thorn in the devil's side. Like we said, kingdom, dominion. This is aggressive nature. This is something deep within us that there's a fight that we need to push this. We need to have this happen. Instead of just praying for the Holy Ghost and praying for revival, and we should pray for it. But like God move in our city, move in our schools, move in our workplaces. God's saying, would you just move in your school and would you move in your workplace? And if you move, I'll move, God said. God will be with us, but we need to take some steps in faith. The good news, church, is not about how we start. It's about how we finish. It's not about how much of the Bible we know. It's not about how talented you are. We rely wholeheartedly on the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost. Pastor Mitchell said Christianity is something that you experience. It is not just theology. Well, we can preach sermons, and they are great, perfect sermons. They, they sound really nice. But if no one's changing, the, the sermon's pointless. Because there needs to be a power behind the words. It's not just words. It is power. 1 Corinthians 2.4 And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. And thank God for that. Every pastor could say amen. Thank God. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Pastor, there must be a demonstration of the Holy Ghost in your, in your church. You must push for this. Don't pray for the sick only when the evangelist comes. Don't pray for the Holy Ghost only when the evangelist comes. Don't go out there if you're going to pioneer. Don't go build a Baptist church. We're not called to build Baptist churches. We're called to build Pentecostal churches with the Holy Ghost moving and press on for that. You know, don't get intimidated. What if they, what if they think? What are they? I don't care. Our first three weeks, I pray for the Holy Ghost. Some guys, they're praying for him. One guy, he was praying in tongues just to think that he was <laughs> praying in tongues. Little, anyway. 
<laughs> That's the guy there. <laughs> so to make impact in hell, church, we only need the Holy Ghost. Don't worry about what you are and your talents and who, what people think of you. When, when David went for Goliath, Goliath's like, who's this little punk kid? Who's this little dude? Well, I'm going to feed him. Well, he's nothing. But David said, who the heck are you? I'm going to take you out. My, my God's going to feed you. I'm going to knock you out. I'm going to chuck a rock and kill you. It was great. Because it's not about him. It's about God moving inside of him. One of the great men, uh, one of my heroes is William, William uh, Seymour. He's the, the founder of the one that started the Azusa Street Revival. But this man, listen to me, he was a poor, one-eyed black man in that society. He, he, was not, he had scars all over his face because of disease. He had to grow his beard to cover his scars. He was totally uneducated, totally unknown, and he's totally rejected. He was physically deformed. They met in a, in a building uh, that was an old beat-down warehouse. The warehouse was previously used to store tombstones. Imagine you call your pastor, I've got a new church. They, they used to put tombstones there, but we're going to have a revival. Probably wouldn't work. The ceiling was eight foot high. Half my church wouldn't even fit into the building. They're too tall. They're just, well, it's not a good place. But God moved, and within 12 months, they were having prayer meetings and church services all around the clock and drawing crowds of up to 1,500 people. The same God that did it back then could do it today. I have full faith in that. It's not about our talents. It's not about how good we look in front of people. It's about the Holy Ghost using our lives. Listen, God is a master of using the unlikely, the low in society. He's a master of that and using them for extraordinary tasks. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So that should give us great confidence. That should give us boldness and passion that when we go, God's going to move. When Jesus came to this earth, he didn't pick the best people. He picked the fishermen, these young dudes. He didn't pick the most talented. He didn't uh, pick the, the wisest or the smartest. He just picked guys that, would, that could give themselves to, to him and follow him. And they did it and God moved. Listen, you might be here this morning and say, man, I haven't really been doing that. But it, that's okay. Because God's mercy and his faithfulness is new every single day. That from this moment forward, you can make a decision. You say, I'm, I, I want to make my, my life to count. I want to make, make a change. You know, Gideon, I love the story. They go to Gideon. His, and he's like, oh, you mighty man of valor, but he's hiding. Listen, you might make mistakes, but God can still use you for great things. Don't worry about failures. Don't worry about mistakes. God can still use us. It's time to get up, and it's time to get moving. In the NBA, as I close, there's a shot clock. And that shot clock is 24 seconds. Every play must be done inside that shot clock. You have 24 seconds to make a play or to take the ball off you. And that needs to be our mentality in Christianity that we need to make a play today. This week, what are you going to do for God? Don't just say, oh, in my lifetime, one day I'm going to... You don't know if you're going to have one day. James 4, your life is like a vapor. It's just going to go real quick. What are you doing this week? What are you doing this month for Jesus? Make, make a play today. Make, make influence quickly. Don't wait one day we'll do this and go to such and such a city. Do it today. God's waiting on you. God's moving. And he wants to move through your life. I love the story of Samson. He's there. And he goes and he's, he wants to attack the enemy. He gets these, the, the foxes and he lights the tails on fire and, it gets tired, and they go out and they burn all the, the plants and stuff. And they, it's, it's such a great, great story. It's such destruction. I love destruction stories. They're great. But that's the first conference. Because when we come to conference, what happens? We get our butt whipped and we get set on fire for God. And then we go back to our city. And we need to go back to our city and light some spiritual fires for Jesus Christ. We're the real salvation army now. We're taking over. We're going to take dominion. And so all of us, we need to push forward and kingdom dominion. Go all out. Depend on the Holy Ghost. Stop wasting your life living for yourself, living for money. Or how good you can throw a ball. Who cares? We're going to heaven one day and our goal is to take as many people as we can to that heavenly kingdom. Make your life count. Be part of hell's most wanted team. And let's see Jesus move in our generation. Amen. Praise God. Let's welcome Pastor.